In this Godot multiplayer tutorial, we're going to be making a server map so that we can do some server-side physics. Let's get started. I'm here on the client project and I'm looking at the client map. The client map is responsible for all the collision detections, whether an ice spear hits a werebear or whether a player bumps into a tree. We don't want these collision detections to be done on the client because that is inherently exploit sensitive. We need to be making a server map and feed the server with collision data so that the server can take over all the collision calculations. In order to do that, we're first going to extract the collision data out of this map, make it a server map, then we'll do the same for the ice spear and the werebear so that we can see some things going on. Then, in the next video, we'll work on the actual collision detection server side and the calculations for that server side. To get started with our server map, I'm first going to be pulling a duplicate of the map that we have here on the client. I'm going to right click my map.tscn and I'm going to select duplicate. I have to give this a name and this name needs to be different than the original map. It doesn't really matter how you name this map, you can always rename it later once you've moved it to the server. So in my case, I'll just call it server map so I can easily distinguish between the two. I'll open up this server map. That's extremely important. They're going to look identical, so it's really easy to make some accidental changes on your original map. And that's, of course, what you don't want. It's a good practice to just close this map altogether so you only have the duplicate open. Now, with that done, we have to consider what the server actually is going to need. It's not really going to need any textures because, well, nobody's looking at it. In fact, the lighter that we can make this, the better, because it will make the server executable smaller and it won't have any baggage. So for example, a graphical user interface with a login screen, our server doesn't need that. It's players logging into the server. The server's not going to log into itself, so we can remove that. And tiles, we don't really need tiles. Tiles are just for visual fidelity. They're not here to make the server happy. They definitely don't have any collision data, unless of course you put collision data in your tile maps, then you do need to keep them. I don't have any collision data here, so I'm just gonna delete them. Gonna remove this back fix, and I'll remove oh, my main tiles. And then we are left with this. Well. We also don't really need any trees, so let's open up our trees and let's just delete all our tree sprites. And let's keep that coalition shape, of course. And we need that static body, we need that coalition polygon, but we don't need the actual texture. Then we have a player here, but that player is here because the client always needs to have a player, a representative of the player that's actually playing the game. But the server is not participating in the game, the server only runs the game. So we don't really need a player either. And yeah, it's handy to have a, a Y sort container for some enemies that the server is gonna be spawning in. And if we want coalition detection between all the players, then it's good to have a Y sort for that as well. But yeah, this is actually all we need. Then on the map, it currently has a script, but of course the script on the server is gonna look completely different. So may as well disconnect that one. And here you have it. We, all we really are left with is a bunch of containers and some coalition data. In this case, our four coalition polygons where our trees are. So let's save this and now we're gonna be putting this on the server. Putting this map on the server is actually a breeze. All we gotta do is copy paste it. I'm right here in my directory where I got my four folders for the four different Godot projects for this tutorial. I'm gonna go in my client, scenes, main scenes, where I have my map and server scene. As you can see, the server scene is considerably smaller than the original map scene that stays on the client, 25 versus three kilobytes. But the biggest save is of course in all the textures, all the sprite sheets, and all the tile sets that no longer have to come to the server. Those easily add up to megabytes. So in total, we have reduced the size of this server map by probably more than a factor of a thousand. So that's a big win right there. I'm gonna be copying this server map I'm gonna go back to all those projects, I'm gonna go to my server project, and here on the scenes, and I've created a new map world, I'm gonna be pasting it in. As you can see, I've already got it, along with my server werebear and my server ice spear, as I've, of course, prepared a little bit of for this tutorial. Now, with it in here, we can have a look at the server project and what we're actually gonna do with it there. I'm on the server project now, and as you can see by the node tree, we now have the world map, which is an instance of that server map.tscn. 
our three coalition polygons have now popped up on the screen. This scene loads in without any issue, without any broken references, because there's no references in this scene anymore. There's no references to textures, no references to sprite sheets, no references to uh, resource files for the tile set, no tile set textures that it requires. It's basically an empty shell with just a couple of elements that are native to Godot. The coalition polygons are native, the static body 2Ds are native, and a couple of containers, Node2D and y sorts, are native to Godot as well. So any project that you put this uh, scene in will load it up automatically. Now, if you require some of those textures, maybe because your tile set has a lot of coalition data, you have to make sure that in the file manager, you set up exactly the same node structure, put your textures and possibly your trace files in there as well. And maybe when you load up the map or load up the scene, it may come up with a pop-up that it cannot find certain references and you'll have to fix those references. However, the leaner you can make your map, the more empty you can make this and the further down now you can get to just a bare bone minimal coalition data, the lighter it's going to be for your server and the faster it's going to be for your server. Now that we have this world map here, which is the server map, you of course also want to know how to make this server ice bear and the server wear bear. So let's get into that and then we'll continue on with actually putting this onto the map and seeing our coalitions move around. I'm back on the client project and I've pulled a duplicate of both the ice spear and the werebear. So these are these two scenes on the top here and we're gonna be reducing these two scenes together to their bare minimum. So for the ice spear, we definitely will not require any sort of animations because nobody is looking at this. So we can definitely delete the animation tree and the animation player. For the sprite, it's exactly the same. We don't need any of these visuals on the server. All we really care about is the collision data. So also for the sprite, we will be deleting this. That keeps us with just a rigid body 2D and a collision polygon, which is perfect for our server. Now we also have a server uh, or a signal, sorry, and a script. Of course, the script, same story, we're gonna be deleting that. The script we're actually going to be requiring to spawn this ice spear in is going to be very similar, but I prefer to pull this scene from one project to the other project without any references to other documents that it might start to be looking for. Otherwise, we might have broken links, and I prefer to just make this copy pass as clean as possible from one project to the other to ensure I don't get any uh, bad bugs or weird glitches or something like that. Same is going to be for the signal. I prefer this to just be disconnected so it is as clean as possible. And just like that, we're gonna be putting it on the server. Now I'm gonna not gonna be showing you how I put it on the server again, because that's of course just a repeat of that copy paste that I just earlier. I'm pretty sure you can do that by yourself. So now let's switch over to the server where there. Well, it has a health bar, but who really cares about his health bar? The server already knows the health of the web bear, and that's simply an integer, a data point in a dictionary. It's not required to be on the screen. Nobody's looking at the server. For the animation player, same story, don't need that. The hitbox, that one is important because the hitbox is where the collision detection is taking place between this werebear and, for example, an ice spear. So we're definitely going to be needing to keep this hitbox here. Sprite, same story, let's delete it. Now the werebear is currently in a group. We might need that group again on the server. For now, we're just gonna delete it. We'll add that group again on the server side if we really need that. Script, same story, we're gonna be deleting it. And that's it, that's our wear bear. And as you can see, this wear bear is gonna look exactly the same as for example, a skeleton might look, or maybe a squire or a knight or a spearman would look. Like if you have one size for a humanoid kind of creature, and although a wear bear is not really a humanoid, it's pretty much almost the same, you can probably use the same setup, hitbox and collision polygon, for pretty much any humanoid kind of character that you may have. Of course, if you also have a dragon, you'll probably need like a specific big coalition shape for that one. But yeah, you can probably figure out how you can pretty much optimize this code and these scenes by a lot by not naming this a server bear bear, but just naming this an enemy or a standard enemy or a humanoid enemy on the server. You need much less scenes that way. So with that set, we'll save this one too. I'll bring this over to the server project, or actually I already have, as you saw, and then we'll move on actually spawn in some ice spears and some werebears. I'm now on the client project and I'm looking at the player script. 
On the player script, we have our function attack, which does two things. It instances in an ice spear for this client, and it communicates to the game server that it has attacked, so that the server can update all the other clients or inform all the other clients to instance in an ice spear as well. Now, on top of that, we also want the server itself to instance in a server version of that ice spear, so it can start taking over the collision detection system. We do that by pushing three more variables into this function, and those are going to be the input rotation, position, and direction. Now we don't want these value definitions, which are already pretty long lines by themselves, to go into this single line because that would make an ultra long line difficult to read, difficult to maintain. So we're first going to be defining these value definitions into variables that we can then push into the game server send attack function. We do that as such. We simply still instance in an ice spear for this client, but we first define that rotation position and direction into variables. With those variables, we can make the game server send a tackle and we can push those A rotation, A position and A direction in there where we previously had three, four, five that were just placeholders. And of course we can use the same variables to now push them straight into our ice spear instance. We don't have to redefine those values again. So with that done, we can now have a look quickly on the game server script, which is going to get that send attack function. And send attack now is simply going to be receiving that rotation position and direction, and is going to be pushing those values into our RPC call, which is then sent off to the server. Switching to the server, we can now see on our game server, our main interface, that remote function attack is going to receive those variables and is not going to do anything with those variables in terms of sending it to other players. That's not required. We already programmed how other players are going to spawn uh, all those instances in. What we can do now, though, is that we now can we can get the node world map where I've added a script to. We can run a few new function, spawn attack. We're going to give it a spawn time and the rotation position direction and the player ID because we do want to know which player has hit anything so that we can award the right player with, for example, experience points. So the spawn time here is something that I won't be using in this tutorial, but it could be something if you want to um, sync up the time of this ice spear. So you can put the timestamp on the ice spear, but of course there's a little bit of latency between the player and the server. If it is absolutely crucial for the, your game, especially related in PvP, then you might want to sync up that ice spear so that it flies out either a little bit faster or it immediately catches up by going forward a little bit for whatever time it was spawned into the world already. That way you have more precision, which is more important for PvP. I won't be doing that here right now because now we're just dealing with a still standing wear there really. So, on the world map script, so let's go to the world map node, that new node, the map node. We got a new script here. And in here, let me close this one. We'll get into the web in a moment. We got the spawn attack. It's gonna receive those variables. And here you can see we do something pretty similar to what we have been doing on the client side. We simply define a new instance of the ice spear, which is a preloaded scene right here. We're gonna send that player ID. So that player ID is a new variable on the ice spear. So that when the ice spear hit, it knows which player that ice spear originated from. So we can reward experience points and stuff like that. We push that impulse rotation position and direction exactly like we did on the client. And we add that child to the world. Now let's also have a look at the actual ice spear code to see how it actually starts moving. The ice spear code is almost a one-on-one -on -one copy of the code that used to be on the client side as we pretty much want the behavior of the ice spear to be identical to what the player sees. Otherwise, we're going to get weird artifacts. So this is, of course, all set on the code we just had a look at. The player ID is the only thing that's different compared to the client side of the script. Uh, under the ready function, we have that same apply impulse function. We are starting the self-destruct function to make sure that it self-destroys the scene after the lifetime of three seconds. We point the collision shape in the right direction. We have commented out the set damage function for now that's going to be something that we'll be implementing in the next tutorial we have the self-destruct function and of course our function on ice spear body entered doesn't trigger right now as we've taken out that signal we have disconnected that we'll be reconnecting that up in the next tutorial when we actually do the collision detection system and start doing the damage part entirely on the server so that the client cannot get in between there now we have an ice spear that's going to be spawning in but of course we need some wear bears so let's first make sure that we spawn these werebears in. As soon as we got them spawned in, we can do a quick demonstration. 
Now our enemies are going to be so much easier because we don't even have to go from the client to the server because the server is authoritative. So the server decides when an enemy spawns and where an enemy spawns. So we're going to go to the map script where we have our function spawn enemy. We have our randomization which selects a random enemy, puts it at a random position within a spawn timer. Right here, once we have defined our enemy, we're putting it in our enemy list. That enemy list at that point contains all the data we require. A position, an enemy type, if you have different coalition shapes, and an enemy ID, so we know which one we are hitting or which one we are killing in our collision system. Right here, we need one extra line of code. We're simply going to approach that world map node again. We're going to run the function spawn enemy. In my case, I've only added the enemy ID and the location and not the enemy type, as I only have one scene for enemies. If you have a game where you only have humanoids and you can make use of the same base format for an enemy in terms of coalition shapes, then you don't need to push the enemy type. If you got different enemy types with different types and shades, Chases, shapes and different hitbox sizes then of course you will need to communicate that type so that the correct scene can be instanced in. Now once we have that spawn enemy we go back to our server map we have our function spawn enemy which is going to pull off a new instance from the preloaded scene of that server where there is going to set the position is going to set the name as the enemy id and we are simply going to be adding it to our y sword enemies. Just like that, we have our coalitions now on the server. So let's give this a spin. Now let's have a look at the server. As you can see, our WebBear has already spawned in. You can see the coalition shape right here. We don't see this on the client yet because the client hasn't logged in. Now we'll log in the client. And as you can see, the WebBear is there. It already lost some health. Now, if I were to shoot an ice spear, you can see on our server that we have our air spear coalition shape moving out. And as you can see, we can hit this wear bear just like as well we can hit it on the server, we can hit it on the game. Now, on the game it currently dies because it does the hit detection still, we haven't broken that out yet. And on the server it remains because simply we don't have the hit detection on the server yet, so we don't know when to despawn it or we haven't coded that in. It's going to be the next tutorial. There's one thing that I want to point out here, and that is that the ice spears have a certain choppiness to them on the server. That choppiness is a result of when we created the very first state processing, when we processed the world state. When we did that, we set the actual frames per second of the physics engine to 20 instead of 60. And as a result of that change, these ice spears are now also being updated with 20 frames per second. In some games, this can be enough as the projectiles move either very slowly or maybe it's turn-based. And at that point, you're absolutely fine. If you got a little bit more of a high speed or a higher pace game, you might want to change that so that the collision shape is updated more often and cannot glitch through walls or something like that because it has traversed the wall before the actual update of the collision shape took place. So I'm going to show you really quickly how you can make sure that these ice spears update at 60 frames per second, but the world state processing still happens at 20 times per second. To make these changes, I of course first have to go into my project project settings. Under my physics section in the common tab, I'm going to move my physics FPS back to 60. Now in my state processing part, I'm going to be adding a couple lines of code here. I'm going to move this one up with an indentation. I'm going to add this code with this extra variable. Now we have a sync clock counter, which starts at zero. And every time that the physics process function runs, which now runs at 60 frames per second again, we're going to add one to that clock. If that clock hits free, we're going to reset it back to zero. And here we're going to be playing that world state syncing process. In other words, 60 divided by three, we now have 20 frames per second again on our world state processing. Well, we do have those 60 frames per second for our ice spear. So now the ice spears are going to look a lot smoother. To give that a super quick demonstration, I'm back here on my project. And as you can see, the ice spears are no longer as choppy as they used to be. And as you can see, they already find the collision with our bears, but we don't actually do the collision detection yet. We don't have any signal set up yet. We don't do any on hit functions yet. We don't take off any health yet on the server side based on this collision. And of course, we have to break out all the collision detections that are happening on the client so that the client loses his exploit possibility. So that's going to be up for the next tutorial. I hope to see you there.
That was it for today, guys. Hope you liked this video. If you did, smash that like button, hit subscribe. Don't forget that little bell icon to make sure that you don't miss out on the next video where we're going to be completing the server-side coalition detection system. Until then, keep on gaming, keep on coding. See you later, guys.